<clears throat> Good evening. I am a grateful Christian who struggles sometimes with love, abandonment issues, low self-esteem, anger, and my name is Bob. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I would like to just reiterate what Rick and uh, Terry said about the, uh, about the yard sale that we had on Saturday. It was a very, very good event. You could see the hand of God there. You know, <clears throat> it was raining on Saturday, and um, in some cases we didn't really publicize that sale as much as we could have or should have, and yet the people came, and uh, it was just a great success. So I just thank God for that. That was strictly his doing, and we were just so, <clears throat> so in awe of everything that he did. It's really good. And I want to thank all of you, too, that came and helped and participated in that event as well. Really appreciate your help. I would like to also mention that we are going to have a concert coming up this Saturday. Uh, if you don't know about it, there's a flyer. It looks kind of like this. It's over here on the side, and there's some out in the lobby as well. <clears throat> this concert is going to be this Saturday. It's going to start at 730 it's going to go to 9 o'clock, or 9.30, excuse me, uh, right here at Creekside in the auditorium where you're sitting now. We're going to have four groups that are going to be performing. The Celebrate Recovery Band, the one that we heard tonight. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> They're going to be uh, performing. Uh, the Jason Starling Band, that's another group. And then we have the Andrew, Andrew Palmer Band. And then we finally have a group called the Natural Notes. That's a group from the, the El Shaddai Church which is over here is it on Llewellyn, is that where it is? On Llewellyn. So it's going to be a very, very good evening of, for music. And in between the sets, we are going to be auctioning, or not auctioning, but raffling off some huge baskets of Ghirardelli chocolate. These are big wow. baskets. I mean, they're like, they're like this. <laughs> and uh, they have a retail value of like $180, I believe, something like that. Uh, and then finally, the, the last uh, raffle is going to be a Harley Davidson pin set. It's a... Uh, vintage pen set actually so it's quite quite uh, valuable and we're going to be raffling that off as well so there's going to be some good prizes for you when you come so what I'd like you to do is everybody take one of these flyers and plan on coming this Saturday and then invite half a dozen of your friends to come as well and by the way it's uh, donations are accepted we're not charging admission there's no ticket price but we're, we're looking for donations love offering okay thank you Everybody understand? <clears throat> okay, good. Well, pardon? Oh, bring cookies. Okay. Yeah, we are going to have uh, in the multi-purpose room, we're going to have some coffee and some uh, hot drinks, I guess, and then cookies, lots of cookies. So we need cookies. Each of you bring 25 dozen cookies. <laughs> no, that's a little bit too much. <clears throat> 12 dozen, okay. <laughs> All right, anything else on that? Good. Well, tonight we're going to do another lesson in our series of lessons. Um, this lesson is lesson number 19, and it's called Crossroads. So, <clears throat> does everybody have a bulletin package? And there's a couple of hand, there's a handout actually that goes along with it. And if you don't have these things, there's some over here on the side table. You're free to get up and go get them if you wish, because I'm going to be referring to them during the course of the, the discussion. I'd like you to take your note sheet out of your bulletin package, please. I want you to find principle number seven. This is our first look, by the way, at principle number seven. And it reads, reserve a daily time with God for self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer in order to know God and his will for my life and to gain the power to follow his will. This is a very important principle, and we're going to really dig into it tonight. Corresponding step that goes along with this is the from the 12-step program is step number 10, and it reads, it's also in your notes there, we continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. That's step number 10. We're going to talk about both of the principle and the step tonight, and to help us do that, we're going to use an acrostic, like we always do. Tonight's acrostic is the word 10, T-E-N. And as we typically do, we're going to use each one of the letters to talk about some particular aspect of doing this, implementing this principle and this step. So let's begin with the first letter, which is the letter T. Now, T stands for take time to do a personal inventory. Now, you may remember back when we were doing our other inventory. That was in principle four. That's when we started actually doing what we call our big inventory. In that particular process, what we did is we examined our past history. 
And our objective was to look into the past to find out the underlying reasons and causes why we have hurts, habits, and hang-ups. As you may remember, we spent a lot of time doing this, and we came up with some very, very useful information. In many cases, sometimes we, we learn things for the very first time. Tonight we're going to talk about doing something similar in principle number seven. Now, if you compare principle four with principle number seven, you're going to see some similarity, or a similarity, put it that way. You're going to see a similarity, and you're going to see a difference. I think the principle and the both, both principles are in your notes. You can actually look at both of them and compare them. See, they both talk about doing inventory. But principle four focuses on, on the past, whereas principle number seven focuses on the present. See, one, principle four, looks at past history. Principle seven looks at current events. That usually brings up a question. Why is it necessary to do that? Isn't doing principle four, doing our big inventory sufficient? And the answer is no. And the primary reason is that current events turn into past history. And if we don't deal with problems when they come up and when they happen today, they can cause hurts, habits, and hang-ups to happen in the future. It's very simple. What we don't deal with today can ultimately turn into future hurts and habits and hang-ups. See, the problem is, it's always the same. We're still sinners. Every one of us is a sinner. That condition hasn't changed. So what happens? We continue to make mistakes, continue to be dysfunctional. And we need to know when that happens so we can make corrections, so we can take action at the time these things come up. Principle number seven provides us with the methodology and the means to be able to do that. Okay, so when is a good time to do self-examination? One of the best times is when we have our quiet times with the Lord. Each one of us should be having quiet times. That's part of the Christian life. And most specifically, that's a very important part of our recovery program. So for those of you who are not familiar with quiet times, <clears throat> I would like to take a moment and explain to you what they are. Very simply, a quiet time is time we spend each day with God certain time, certain place, that we spend with God doing three things. We do Bible study, we do prayer, and we do self-examination. And that's exactly, by the way, what principle number seven is telling us to do. Take a look at principle seven again. Just look in your notes there at principle seven. See what it says. It says, reserve a daily, see that, daily time with God. See, that's a quiet time. For what? For self-examination, Bible reading, and prayer. See that? And why do we do that? It tells us, in order to know God and His will for my life and to gain the power to follow His will. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is to talk about these three specific areas that comprise quiet times. I've given you some handouts which cover these things. So what I want you to do is get those handouts so we can take a look. Again, if you don't have one of these handouts, they're over here on the side. You're welcome to get up and go get one first area that we're going to talk about <clears throat> is Bible study. That's the first thing in your handout. I'll wait a second for people to get their, their sheets. Don't be bashful. If you don't have them, go get them. <laughs> okay. Bible study. Very, very important because it communicates God's thoughts. See, the Bible contains God's thoughts. I don't know if you ever, ever uh, give that any consideration or not, but that's what it is. Everything in the Bible is God's thoughts. Now, it's not all of his thoughts, to be sure, but it's the ones that he wants us to know. So it's important to understand that the Bible contains God's thoughts. And knowing God's thoughts is absolutely vital to living an effective life. Romans 12.2. I want you to write that passage down in your notes. Romans 12.2 says, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. What that means is that we can change our behavior by changing the way we think. Very interesting pr premise, but it's true. So what we do here is we identify our bad thinking and we replace it with God's thinking. 
shifting one for the other. We isolate and identify our bad thoughts, all the things that are not productive, all the things that are pulling us down, all the uh, areas where we are inclined to go into sin, and we replace them with what God thinks. And as we do that, the more we do that, the more we begin to think like God, and that ultimately changes our behavior. So I believe that this is the single most important reason for doing Bible study, putting God's thoughts into our head, letting those thoughts percolate, thinking about those thoughts, meditating on those thoughts, and letting them impact our lives. That's how it works. Now, there's lots and lots of ways to do Bible study, as you can imagine, and they're all good. I'm not going to say that one is better than the other. Now, one method that I like to use is called the two-question method of Bible study. I've talked about this before, I believe. Some of you probably have heard this discussion in the past, <clears throat> but I'm going to do it again. And it's in your note package there. I've included a description of this two-question method of Bible study. And let's take a look at how this method works. Before we get into the steps, though, let me just say this. First thing you need to do when you're doing Bible study is schedule it. You've got to put it on your schedule. Now, that might seem obvious, but, you know, I'm going to tell you, most of us don't do that. Most of us do Bible study when we can fit it in, when it's convenient. And as you can imagine, that does not promote consistency. See, it's a hit-and-miss system at best. Bible study has to become a habit. And just like every other habit, it takes some effort to put it into place. But once it's in place, you know, it almost becomes automatic. And what that means then is we have to do it every day, at the same time, same place. That's the key to developing a habit, doing it consistently, every day, same time, same place. Good idea is to put Bible study on your planner and don't let anything else preempt it. For me, I put it down in my, my planner and I, I have 7.30 in the morning. I put down QT, quiet time, and I don't let that get preempted. It's very seldom will I ever let that get preempted. And I always do that, almost always do that. It's, it's become such a habit with me that if I don't do it, I, I really feel it. It has such a great impact on me. See, there's an old saying which says, if you don't schedule something, it's never going to get done. And I believe that's true. Okay, so let's take a look at the steps. Step number one says, begin your Bible study by asking the Holy Spirit for help. And we can do that by praying something like this. It's in your notes there. Dear Holy Spirit, I ask you to teach me in my Bible study. Thank you for doing this. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, why would we do that? Why would we start our Bible study out that way? Well, Holy Spirit wrote the book. So it just makes good sense to ask him for help in understanding it. Because sometimes, and I'm sure you all agree with me, the Bible is not that easy to understand. But when we ask the Holy Spirit to help us in our study, he always does. He always responds to that request because he wants us to know the truth, and he wants us to use it in our lives. All right, that's step one. Step two, select a passage and read it. Does it matter what passage we select? Not at all. All Scripture is good. I want you to take a look at 2 Timothy on the screen here. All Scripture is inspired by God. You see that? It comes from God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. See that? It's a really good reason to do Bible study. It straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. It's God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good thing God wants us to do. Okay, so <clears throat> you're trying to figure out what passage you want to read. And let's say you're trying to decide maybe you want to read something in the book of Leviticus or perhaps maybe the Gospel of Mark. Well, as a practical matter, I would recommend picking a passage that's kind of user-friendly, one that's a little easier to handle and understand. So in this case, I would pick the Gospel of Mark. Not that the book of Leviticus is bad, because it's not. It's a wonderful book. It's full of good stuff. But the Gospel of Mark is a little easier to get, to get into. Now, the next question that I often get when we're talking about this method of Bible study is, how much scripture should I read at one time? 
And I suggest you use what is called the overwhelm principle. See, the overwhelm principle says, read enough scripture until you feel overwhelmed. That could be just one verse. That happens to me sometimes. I'll read a verse, and I'm getting ready to go into the second verse, and I'll have to stop and say, wait a minute, I don't really understand that first verse. I'm in overwhelm, so I stop. And that's a good indicator. All right, steps three and step four relate to the two questions. Step three says, the first question is, what does the passage say? So here we're looking for background, context, general information, and so forth. Now you might ask, well, how am I going to know that stuff? I'm reading the Bible for the first time. How am I going to get that kind of information? And what I would recommend you do is get, use some, some study aids, things like Bible dictionaries, things like commentaries, things like lexicons, and various other study aids that are available to help you understand the passage you're dealing with. One thing you can do is just get on the Internet. Sometimes I'll put a, a verse in on the Internet, and it'll come out with four or five different commentaries related to that one verse, and it'll tell me the meaning and the context and the general information related to it. Now, let me uh, caution you here when you do this. Don't spend an inordinate amount of time doing this. You're not doing a Ph.D. thesis here. 20 minutes of, of this kind of study is usually sufficient. And as you collect information, write it down. Put it down in your journal. In my journal, I put down the date of today. I put the passage I'm dealing with. And then the first question is, what does the passage say? And right below it, I just put, write down the observations. Just little notes. It's for me, nobody else. It's for you. When you come back later on and you have a certain system of notes, you can understand what you put down. But record that information. This is an essential part of Bible study, and I'll explain why in a moment. Second question is, how can I use this in my life? This is the bottom line of Bible study. See, we want to know how to use what God wants us to know. We want to know how to use that. So that's the question we ask ourselves. And most of the time, you will come up with an application. In fact, sometimes more than one. And when you do, write them down in the journal. Once again, write the question down. How can I use this? And then write down your observations right beneath the question. Now, there's going to be times, and this happens to me sometimes, you'll have no idea how to use that particular passage. No idea at all. So you just write down, I don't know. That's all you do. I don't know how to use this passage. But what will happen, and this is very interesting, it happens to me all the time, sometime later, future time, future Bible study, Holy Spirit will tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, you remember that Bible study back in whatever? And he'll take us right back to that Bible study. And he said, now is the time you can use that. And it's amazing how that happens. But all that stuff comes flowing through. And that's another good reason for recording it in your journals. Because now you have the opportunity to go back and see what you wrote back then. And you're looking at it through a different set of eyes, through a different lens, if you will, and it becomes more useful. It happens all the time. All right, step number five, <clears throat> close with prayer. Pray something like this. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for teaching me. I ask you to bring these lessons to mind as I need them throughout this day and in the future. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that is how to do the two-question method of Bible study. I would recommend you give it a shot and try it out. See what you think. If you have a better method or a different method that's more comfortable for you, then do that. But the important thing to remember is write down what you're learning, particularly how you're going to use it in your life. Sometimes what I'll do, I'll look at an old journal, maybe a year ago, two years ago. I have journals that are 30 years old. <laughs> and I'll go back and look at a journal and I'll say, yeah, what was I learning back then? And what did I say I was going to use in my life? And I'll look at that and then I'll ask the question, did I use that? Did God have an impact in my life? It's very, very useful to do that. Okay, the next area to get into is the area of prayer. Prayer. We should spend time in prayer. question often comes up, what's a good way to pray? Well, again, as you can imagine, there's lots and lots of ways to do that. One way that I like to do, or like to, one approach I like to take is to use an acrostic, interestingly enough, the word ACTS, A-C-T-S. I want to put it on the screen for you. Take a look. Acts stands for four different kinds of prayer. A is adoration. 
C is confession, T is stands for thanksgiving, and S stands for supplication. Four areas of prayer. I'd like to talk about each one. I want to begin with the first one, which is A, and that stands for adoration. Adoration is simply focusing on God. That's what it is. And this is the starting place, always the starting place for all prayer. See, that's the way Jesus started the Lord's Prayer. You may remember? He said, Our Father in heaven, your name, may your name be kept holy. That's one version. Others' versions say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. Different ways of saying it, but it's all the same. See, God is to be acknowledged. We're talking to him. We need to address him. We didn't understand who he is and who we're talking to, and we need to develop a reverence for that. Some people just rush in and say, hey, God, how's things going? See ya. And they're on their way. That is not a reverential way to pray. See, God is our creator. He's our sustainer. He's in control. He's powerful. He's good. He's righteous. He's trustworthy. He's kind. He's generous. He's all these things. And we need to focus on him and his attributes. Now, God wants us to do that. He asks us to do that. Why? Because it's the only way that we're going to learn who he is. If we focus on God, we're going to see his attributes. We're going to see his qualities. And eventually we're going to see how reliable and how faithful he is. And this lets us trust him, which is what he deeply wants. He wants this relationship with us, and he wants it built on trust. He says, come to me, look at me, see who I am. Let me impact your life. And that's the whole idea of looking at God. I want you to take a look at Psalm 34, 8 on the screen. <clears throat> Simple psalm, it says, taste the Lord and see that he is good. Tasting the Lord, that means learning about him and discovering how good he is. The more we do that, the more we focus on God, the more we know about him, the more trustworthy and good he becomes. Okay, next letter is the letter C, and that stands for confession. It's pretty simple what that is. Here we keep, we endeavor to keep, rather, short accounts. See, that means we confess our sins right away as they come up. Because, and there's a good reason for that. Sin interrupts fellowship with God. Sin always does that. Even after we're saved and our sins have been removed, if we continue, if we commit another sin after we're saved, that interrupts fellowship with God. Fellowship with God is very, very important. We'll be talking about that more in a minute. So what he says then is to confess your sins progressively. Why? So he can cleanse them and forgive them and restore us to fellowship and most importantly, have this relationship that he desires to have with each one of us. Let's take a look at 1 John on the screen. This is the passage that talks about that. hope everybody can see that. <clears throat> this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declared to you. God is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. That means there's no sin in God. So we are lying if we say we have fellowship. You see, that's a relationship with God but go on living in spiritual darkness. In other words, we have sin in our lives. See, we're not practicing the truth. John says we're a bunch of liars. But if we're living in the light as God is in the light, meaning if we have no sin in our lives, then we can have fellowship with God. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. See, the blood of Jesus, his death on the cross, which allows salvation, is the reason why we can do this. If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves, not living in the truth. See, as a practical matter, we are sinners. We are going to commit sin. And here's the bottom line. John says, but if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness. He takes the sin away so we can continue to have fellowship. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. So you can see confessing sin is essential to maintaining fellowship with God. It's absolutely essential. Let me put it a different way. If we have unconfessed sin in our lives, 
we will not be in fellowship with God. Unconfessed sin breaks fellowship, and we will not be in fellowship with God. And that's bad. That's very, very bad because we're going to miss out on all his strength, his power, his guidance, his direction, and everything else he wants to do in our lives. Sin always gets in the way of fellowship. Always. And it has to be removed. It's as simple as that. So we need to develop a sin barometer. Be aware of when we screw up. And the moment we do that, we need to confess it. it happened to me last night. I was at a movie with someone. I got into a heated discussion with this individual. We've had the same discussion over and over and over and over. This person's theology is a little bit screwed up. In the past, I've been patient with this individual, but last night I was not patient. I lost it. And I said, you know, your theology is all screwed up. And it will always be screwed up until you change and begin to understand the truth. And he looked at me and he was like, you know, he's ready to hit me, I think. At least I thought he was. <laughs> oh, Lord, don't let this guy hit me. Anyway, that, I blew it. I, I was very unkind and uncomplimentary. And when I walked away, I felt so awful. I told my wife, Gail, I said, you know, I really feel horrible. She says, well, good old Gail, confess your sin. <laughs> okay, so I did. Confess my sin to God. Ask him to restore me to fellowship, which he did. And then I called this individual up and I apologized to him for saying what I said. Not, the, not what I said, but the way I said it. <laughs> I didn't retract my statement. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, third letter in Acts is T, which stands for thanksgiving. God wants us to be thankful. It's his will. Take a look at 1 Thessalonians. Be thankful in all, see that? Circumstances. <laughs> for this is God's will. This is what God wants us to do. This is a mandate for us who belong to Christ. That's in 1 Thess. All right, so why does God want us to do that? Why does he want us to be thankful in all circumstances? For one simple reason, it gives us correct perspective. See, some people think that when things are going well, they must be doing everything right. Conversely, when things are not going so good, they think they're doing everything wrong. But neither perspective is correct. Only by being thankful and looking at God can we get the per correct perspective. We really find out at that point who's in charge. Final letter is S, stands for supplication. See, supplication is asking God for things. God wants us to do that. He says, you don't have. Why? Because you don't ask. Why don't you look at James on screen? He says, you want what you don't have, so you scheme. You see that? And you kill. In other words, we just try to get it ourselves. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. Isn't that interesting? God says, if you want something, ask me. Now, does that mean he's automatically going to give us everything we ask for? No. And when God does not give us something, the next question, the next logical question is, why? Lord, what's the reason would you tell me the reason? He says in James 1.5, if you need wisdom, ask him and he'll give it to you. God says, just ask me and I'll tell you. I'm going to say no, but I'm going to tell you why. How good is that? It's always for our, for our benefit. All right, the next letter in the uh, acrostic is the letter E. We already did the T once. And that stands for evaluate <clears throat> the good parts and the bad parts of our day. Now, here's where the self-examination part of our quiet time comes in. And remember now, we're only looking at current events. We're just looking at what we've done recently. That means today, yesterday, maybe the past week. And to help you get started with that, I've, I've included some self-evaluation questions in your note package. So I want you to get them out and take a look. These are great questions to ask yourself. And you don't have to ask yourself all these questions at one time. You can ask yourself a couple, three or four, however number you have time for, and see how you stand up, how you stack up. First question. What did I do today or yesterday that was good? See, we're looking at the good stuff too. Where did I blow it today or yesterday? Did I do or say anything that hurt anyone? Do I owe any amends? Who do I need to forgive? What can I learn from my actions? 
What are my character defects? <laughs> now, it's hard to sometimes be objective on this one. Sometimes you need some outside input. You can ask your sponsor or your accountability partner, and they'll give you your input. They'll give you the input on this one. I asked my wife. I asked Gail. She does. She tells me what's wrong. She's very, very sweet about it. <laughs> Where do I feel convicted? What do I need to do about it or them, the convictions that is? And here's a good one. What are the motives for what I'm doing? Do I have an agenda? What is it? Am I selfish? Am I manipulative? Do I try to punish someone? Was I hurt? Was I threatened? Do I feel like I need to be in charge? Do I really dislike this other person? Do I feel like I'm better than this other person? Do I have a hard time loving other people? Do I enjoy controversy? I know people like that. Am I jealous? Do I feel like I've been unjustly treated? Am I looking for revenge? Am I frustrated? Do I have a hard time being empathetic, feeling other people's pain? Do I have fears? Who doesn't? What are they? Was I under the influence of some substance? Am I controlled by other people? See, this is not an exhaustive list by any stretch of the imagination. We can go on and on, but this is enough to get you started. I mean, if you go through and look at all these questions and try to come up with answers, you're going to spend a lot of time doing self-analysis. All right, the final letter in the, le in the acrostic is N. That stands for we need to admit our wrongs promptly. We already talked about this, so I'm not going to cover it again. What I'd like to do now is just quickly recap what we've talked about. We've talked about three disciplines. We've talked about Bible study, prayer, self-examination. We said that these are essential disciplines if we're going to progress in our recovery program. See, Bible study helps us understand God's thoughts and how to put them into our lives. Prayer helps us to communicate with God and He with us. See, prayer is a two-way street. We talk to God and God talks to us. And finally, self-examination helps us make corrections when we get off course. Three essential disciplines we all need to implement, and the best time to do that is in our daily quiet times. Every day. Maybe you don't do all three at one time. Maybe you only do one, or maybe you do two. I don't know. It's up to you. But they all need to be addressed. Very essential disciplines for, for, make, for making progress in the Christian life. Okay, that concludes my remarks. I'd like to conclude with a serenity prayer. Who's doing that tonight? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody? Okay. Eric? Eric, please stand. <clears throat> God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, Taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen and amen. Thank you very much. You may now go to your groups.